I'm Marilyn, CEO and founder of Cosmic Centers, the host of Center Stage, our weekly video series, where we explore bold ideas about the future of work and learning every Thursday afternoon at this hour, 2.30 p.m. UAE time. Myself and some incredible guests uh, hop on on LinkedIn Live to share insights, opinions, and perspectives about how we work and learn. Before we begin, just a reminder, give this video a like, share it with someone who you think might enjoy it, and also, please do add your questions and comments in the box below. Tala, our producer, will be on the lookout for those, and so will I, and hoping Nitesh can answer some of your questions live today. Um, today, we're hosting a Discuss segment with Nitesh Patra. Nitesh is an experienced, mindful leader who has been helping people live a more meaningful and fulfilling life. Nitesh is the founder of the Mindful Initiative, and Ashtanga Yoga Sadhna in Bangalore. He also hosts the Mindful Initiative podcast. He's been teaching yoga, mindfulness, and compassion in NGOs, organizations, schools, and universities for over nine years. And prior to doing that, he worked in the corporate world for 10 years. He also produced two award-winning feature films in India. In 2019, Nitesh was awarded the Compassion Corps grant to teach compassion cultivation training in underprivileged communities. He's the only certified teacher of compassion cultivation training from Stanford Medical School Center of Compassion and Research and Education. Nitesh learned yoga philosophy in the Krishna Masharya tradition, and he is currently enrolled in the five-year basic program of Buddhism at Jamyan Buddhist Center in London. He holds a bachelor and master's degree from University of Maryland College Park. And if that wasn't enough, he completed his MBA from Indian School of Business, Hyderabad. Nitesh is joining us today from Bangalore, where he lives with his wife and his three-year-old daughter. Nitesh, we're so grateful for your time. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me, Marilyn. I'm incredibly grateful to have you and also for one of the suggestions that you made as we were preparing for this episode. Uh, we usually jump right into questioning our guests, but you suggested that perhaps we could start the session with intention setting and also you'll be closing the session perhaps with a very short meditation. So over to you, I guess. Yeah, thank you so much and, and thank you for uh, having me as a guest and, and thank you for letting me say uh, a small intention for all of us, uh, beginning with two of us and Tala here, and the others who are listening and, and people who would be listening in, at a later time. Uh, so why don't we just close our eyes, uh, maybe for a few seconds. Inhaling through our nose. And exhaling through our mouth. Inhaling again. And exhale. One final time, inhaling through our nose. And exhaling through our mouth. So as our breath settles down, as our mind quietens, let's set an intention to hold this space, to be here, to be aware, and to be very thankful, having the gratitude, and always remembering that our breath will bring us back to our present moment. Maybe a few more seconds of breathing in through your nose, and breathing out. And let's open our eyes. Thank you so much for that. It's a first. I feel very quiet, considering it's a LinkedIn Live. I, uh, my blood pressure isn't as high as it usually is. <laughs> so thank you so much for that. Um, 
Actually, it's interesting that we started with this meditation. Uh, we're here, we're going to be discussing mindful leadership and, and self-compassion today. And um, I wanted to start actually by saying that I'm usually quite skeptical about the word mindful. Uh, I always like to joke that my mind is always full. <laughs> so, um, but, but also possibly because of the way that it's been portrayed, especially in the, you know, in the last few years, um, I think there's a kind of a, a certain way of being and, and a certain kind of person that's associated with a word like mindfulness uh, that kind of for someone like me who's, who's sort of always, uh, you know, likes to say how pragmatic and rational I am, uh, has kind of pushed me on the edge of that word. You know, I'm like, mm, I don't know if I kind of um, am able to identify with it. So I'd love for you to maybe start with explaining what you or how you define mindfulness or how mindfulness is defined, you know, in its like kind of original state. Hmm. Um, thank you for that question. And I think it's a, uh, it's a good s start to a conversation where we're setting the foundation uh, of my understanding of m what mindfulness is and, and what mindfulness in general means. Um, and the other thing that you talked about, the skepticism that's associated uh, for you, but maybe for some of the others. Uh, so the term mindful uh, has come in from the teachings in India a uh, long, long time ago, whether it was the yoga philosophy that started it in the Yoga Sutras, uh, where it was defined in, in one, of, uh, one of the books called Patanjali Yoga Sutras. And then it went over uh, on the Buddhism side where, where uh, Buddhist practitioners uh, have taken it and has been practiced in many ways. And, and they have gone much further uh, in exploring what mindfulness is, or I should rather say understanding what the mind is. Uh, one of the things that I continuously talk to people about, uh, where is the mind? We talk about body and mind, uh, but where is the mind? Um, and most people don't have, an, um, don't have an answer because we also don't have an answer where it is. It's something that we experience. It's something that we're experiencing in many ways, um, and one of the best ways that I have found out that you experience is, is by doing something that you love, doing something that you really enjoy. Uh, it may be uh, uh, an outdoor activity, it may be painting. For some, it may be watching television. It doesn't really matter, you know, something that stimulates you. Uh, in, in, in the modern terms, uh, it has been now defined uh, in a scientific way, uh, that it's being in the present moment, being aware of your thoughts. Um, and uh, that is something that is helping us explore that we don't know where it is. And we're just imagining that it is this invisible force that's somewhere, and then we know what it is. The other aspect of the mind uh, that we look at is that it's an infinite space. Um, and the reason why not just me, but uh, all these saints, all these practitioners who have come before us, uh, they say it uh, because think of the memories that you have from your childhood. They keep going in and in and in and in and in. Uh, and and uh, I, I think science uh, somewhere says that every, uh, every day we are, uh, we have like 60,000 thoughts uh, that we are, uh, observing and where are they going? You know, some of them do stay and look at the number of years that we have lived, number of days. Uh, so mindfulness is uh, is more defined as being in the present moment, but it's a gateway to starting to understand what our mind is composed of. And once you start entering that domain, magic starts to happen. And it's not that you have not done it. Uh, but maybe we'll, we'll talk more about it, uh, what it is. Yeah, that's very interesting because as Tala and I were, were discussing and preparing for this session and I, you know, in my usual kind of ironic way, I was like, oh, I don't understand. I don't even know what I'm going to ask Nitesh because I don't understand this language. Tala actually pointed out to me that she actually thinks that I'm a very mindful person in that sense of... Um, the way that I make decisions, the way that I deal with the present tense, um, that I do like show that behavior, but that I've been alienated by what I think is like a very hippie kind of 
world and especially now like it's been kind of hijacked and turned into a brand and but she was saying it you might not call it that but you you are a very mindful person and a mindful decision maker and a mindful leader uh, and so yeah it's very um it's a very interesting way to look at it as using the present tense as a gateway to explore what our minds are or where they are if we can locate that one day um and I, yeah, I really look forward to asking you a few more questions. So do forgive me if sometimes my questions um, sound a bit probing, but it is really because I'd like to understand how to reattach myself to these concepts in a way that um, is as who I identify and, and not as like a, this image of what it means to be mindful. Um, and today we're gonna be exploring a few concepts as well. Uh, one of them being that the concept of self-compassion and impermanence. Uh, I was hoping you'd also kind of walk us through what that means before I start probing you with questions. Uh, yeah, so the other uh, aspect uh, of our life that we live in is, uh, as humans, we are very action-oriented. We are always doing something or the other. Um, and uh, when we do something, it's leading to some result or no result or a result based on the expectation that we have, whether that's met or whether that's not met. Um, an example of it is that let's say you decide to travel from point A to point B. You're in Dubai and you're like, uh, I want to go over to Bangalore. Uh, so you would get into a cab or a car or somehow reach the airport. Maybe you live close to the airport. You walk down to the airport. Uh, you get there, you catch your flight and, and you reach there. Um, and uh, for some reason, uh, when you reach, you reach on time and everything is perfect. You're elated. You're like, wow, this is amazing. Um, and you have a meeting to attend. You go to your meetings and do whatever. Um, but on the other hand, let's say you go in and you book your Uber and the Uber driver is late. You're like, wow, what a great start. And, uh, and then you get to the airport. There's this huge line. I was early, but look, I'm late. There's just thousands of people in the line. I'm going to make it, but I have to wait. And you know, the, the inside chatter starts and you get onto the plane and you're sitting, sitting next to some uh, young children like mine, like, you know, I have a three-year-old who's amazing in the airplane for us, but not for the others. Uh, and you're like, wow, I was so tired. I was thinking of catching up sleep and, and all the chatter that's happening, right? And, uh, and once you get to the, get to the place, you know, you're not in your best thing and you don't perform the way that you expect. And you're like, you know, it, it just didn't happen. And, you know, maybe I'm responsible. I should have done, the, done things differently. And who do you blame, right? The, the society has programmed us in such a way that, that we, of course, you know, we blame the others, but, you know, then it comes down to me. Maybe I could have done something different and, and there's this whole idea of self-compassion that has come into being, which has always been in existence. Uh, in the past few years, uh, Kristen Neff and Chris Germer introduced this idea of self-compassion. Uh, and, and they have three components about self-compassion, uh, which relates to uh, being mindful, being kind, um, and, and this idea of common humanity. But beyond that, I think self-compassion is just loving yourself as to who you are. Uh, we have certain images of the way we should present ourselves. You have an organization yourself. You're like, you know, we're looking up to this XYZ organization. This is the way we should be. You're a CEO and I should be like this kind of a CEO. Um, and as, as you were mentioning that you are already mindful, which you are uh, in the way that you carry yourself. Uh, we have given these tags to different things so that people can understand it better. And our mind is such that we like to create things that make, uh, create labels so that things become easier for us. So it's there, the, the infinite space of the mind has a storehouse. It has a memory and it's like a database. You just, you know, say, all right, I'm going to look up this word and that thing will come up, right? And what is that thing? It's an emotion uh, or it's some experience uh, and or an emotion related to an experience. All that comes about. Uh, so we're looking at the love aspect of it, which relates to our heart um, and mindfulness. If it relates to the mind, compassion relates to opening up the heart. Uh, 
uh, and self-compassion is having a heart for yourself. Uh, and I, impermanent, uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, it's okay. I was just going to say it's, um, it's very interesting to discuss that because as you say, as a person, as a leader, as a member of a family, like in every kind of aspect of my persona or everybody's personas, um, we all have this thing, right? There's a lot of memes on the internet about like, staying up at night and thinking about how you should have ended an argument five years ago, you know, like uh, these thoughts about how you could have done something differently or better. Um, and it's really helped me in the last few years, I, I started teaching and some, one of the courses that I give is, um, is about sort of design thinking and, ad, and implementing agile methodologies. And I do try to discuss mindset shifts that you need to have in order to be able to do that. And one of them is actually empathy towards oneself, which I guess is a very similar concept. And I've, I find that I apply it to myself when I make a decision and I'm like, oh, I really shouldn't have done that. I, um, the way I, that it works for me now is I'm like, you made the best decision that you could have made given the information that you had at the time. You have to trust that. And I'm going to let you feel bad and sorry for yourself for about 20 minutes. And then we're going to wrap it up, you know, um, and that lets me sleep at night. And I don't wake up thinking about how I should have made a decision differently or acted differently. And I think it's a very important um, concept to have if you're trying to innovate or iterate or do things slightly differently, you're going to make mistakes and you can't kind of spend your whole time self-flagellating. I think that's a beautiful image. You were going to talk to me about impermanence, I think. Uh, just from, from what you were talking about, I, I think uh, the whole idea of impermanence relates to what, what you're saying, because when that moment passes, uh, it's the experiences that stay with us, not the emotions. The emotions disappear. Um, and when that experience is happening, uh, when you're mindful uh, uh, and uh, when you're aware of those thoughts, what is happening at that point of time, you can make a decision uh, of responding versus reacting. And uh, if you are able to respond rather than react, because reaction is is something that you're just, if some someone says something or you do something wrong, you just react right away. Um, just like uh, in lightning, right after the thunder, you can, uh, light after light, you know, you can hear the thunder. So it's it's happening, but there's this, that gap that comes in, right? So I feel that the the lightning is, the, is one of the greatest examples because it's responding. It comes after a while. It comes after some time. And even in that minuscule second, in that small second, if you're able to just take in, understand what the situation is, Will you make that decision? Will you regret that decision by saying X, Y, and Z? And, and what you talked about, the whole idea of uh, being empathetic towards yourself, uh, like I'm the one who'll face myself tomorrow, you won't, right? And if I'm able to live with myself with that decision, I will make that decision. But sometimes we aren't. So uh, that's why it's, it's a beautiful experiment that we keep doing with ourselves. And, and I think life is full of all those experiences. And impermanence is, is the entire uh, encapsulation of that because nothing uh, stays with us. Um, our breath, when we're born, we have our breath. When we'll die, we'll lose our breath. Breath is what's staying with us throughout. Our energy is staying with us throughout. Um, and... Uh, when you have uh, that one constant thing uh, that can help you in many ways, uh, everything is impermanent. So why worry about it? Why worry about it? That's lovely. Someone in the audience said they could listen to you speak all day. I totally echo that feeling. Um, but I will also take a few questions from the audience. Um, and they're edging us almost to where I wanted to also um, explore with you. Um, I think that Mindfulness has also kind of been a concept uh, that, that is applied to oneself a lot. So taking time to meditate or to notice the present or to, you know, realize how you feel, how your body, you know, reacts to sitting on something. Those are some of the practices, let's say, uh, that are done at an individual and personal level. I was also really wanting to explore with you, and we have two questions from the audience um, about teams, so groups of people, and also about leadership. Where, where I want it to guide us. So Maria says, 
how do you foster empathy and mindfulness in teams? So whereas you can express that for yourself, uh, potentially, how do you, what are some of the tools or approaches or frameworks that you can use to do that in a collective? Uh, that's a great question, um, especially given most of us are working remotely now, given that it's the pandemic um, and things are not what they used to be. Uh, so that's, that's one thing that has changed. Uh, so, but what that leads to is one of the things is having an environment uh, which fosters uh, uh, a place where we appreciate each other, uh, where we see other person as a human. I think that's the most important quality. And once you start realizing that everything, our appearance, our language, the way we act, uh, beyond all that is the idea of being human. I think that's, that's a great place to start. Uh, and once you begin with that process of understanding the other person uh, as human, uh, it depends upon who you are. And let's say you are a leader in the team. Uh, always, always uh, this idea of leading by example is the best thing. And, and that's one thing that I have seen. And some of the people that I follow in my life, they lead beautifully by example, because once I see them uh, doing some things in their life, I feel like that's something that I would like to do. Um, one of the examples, um, uh, you know, th there are many examples out there of, of people leading, uh, people leading uh, by example. But what kind of environment or what kind of value system you might like to uh, put it into your team? Uh, so within our community, within our yoga community, we have people who come and practice. Um, and when we were setting the pricing, uh, it's something uh, that as a team, we made a decision that we're going to have a separate set of prizes for men and women uh, because women take holidays because of, uh, because of their, uh, because two or three days, they're not able to practice. Uh, so we have to set a different a different time for that, a different prizes for them. And this is just showing that, you know, that you're caring for your customers, right? You're And if you're showing as a team, if you're starting from the top, that you care for your customers, your team will start to show that. And same in, in your teams as well. If you start showing caring uh, in one way or the other, leading by example, uh, I, I think uh, people will start following eventually. Uh, that That's what I have seen. Yeah, I think that's an incredible example. Um, design thinking in many ways is a not at all in the same universe, but a linked concept uh, because it says that the at the center of if you're designing an experience or a class or a meeting or whatever or a product, you you put the human element. Sometimes it's referred to as human centered design, which is putting the human at the center of what you do again. You were making me think uh, yesterday I was talking to a client and um, she had kind of rescheduled something. Uh, this was the second time that she was moving a meeting and she was really apologetic about it. Um, and I just, I said to her like, why are you so stressed out? It's just a meeting, we can move it. She's like, yeah, but you book your time for me. And you know, like I, I don't, I'm not usually like this but it's been a very overwhelming month. And I'm like, I mean, we, we technically teach people how to increase the flexibility in their workplace. If I'm not going to be flexible about my time with you, then I'm not living by my own values, right? And she was incredibly thankful for that. And as you were talking, it, it just reminded me of that experience yesterday. Um, and I think that it's so important to treat each other as humans. Sometimes we're talking to clients and their kid shows up, you know, and they're so embarrassed and they turn off their video and, and we say like, what do you, I mean, our team has, you know, two members in our team have children and they show up in our calls all the time and we welcome them. And uh, we're happy that they're here because the reason why we create companies and, and try to generate value is at the end of the day to create a livelihood for people as well as like create value for society and whatever we're doing. And being reminded of this 3D aspect of everybody is something that you're making me think about. Um, and, and reminding yourself that a person isn't a click, they're not a KPI, they're not a metric, they're not a deliverable, they're a person. And, and if you just keep that top of mind, then that becomes an acceptable thing to do that your team now does the same thing, right? 
Uh, exactly right. Uh, you have uh, you put it across really well uh, in the way that that we expect, and that's where you start because that's the foundation. When the work needs to be done, it needs to be done, um, and and you start. Uh, like you said, you know, kids are at home, they show up, they show up, right? And uh, if if uh, there are life events happening in people's life, you adjust and accommodate accordingly. And uh, uh, it, it's something that companies start to do from top down. And if leaders uh, put their foot down, I think everyone will understand and they enjoy the place. And uh, I think the other thing which you mentioned uh, um, about creating a livelihood, it, that's absolutely important. But I think the mission of, of what you do, if you're out there to help people uh, and, and communities, uh, I think you will find more meaning in, in your work. Um, uh, it's, uh, yeah, a lot of us, you know, take the work that we, we can't do what we really want to do because of X, Y, Z situation. That always happens. Uh, and 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 sometimes we are in that situation, but slowly and steadily, if you have the intention, that intention becomes a reality one day. Uh, so begin with a good intention. Yeah, I I agree. I had a conversation with my mother a couple of months ago, and she was saying, you know, you're one of the most positive people I know. So I look forward to when you call me because you know, this year has been hard. And so understandably, a lot of people are not in the best place, but I happen to be a very optimistic person this year. And she said, what's your, why is that? And I did say, it's because the job that I do right now is about helping others have a better daily life and spend the time that they spend at work doing something and doing it in a way that fulfills them. And so I feel like I get to help somebody every day and that makes me optimistic. Right. And it generates I get more energy out of it than anybody else. Uh, and I think that's that's kind of um, what you were expressing just now. Yeah, um, absolutely. And, and I think once you realize that that you're going to help someone, I think uh, uh, things come come about. And the other aspect is uh, that uh, this whole uh, general sense of maximization of profit uh, tends to keep driving us crazy. Uh, but I think we can all do with a little less. Uh, uh, it's uh, once we do that with a little less amount. Uh, you've heard of the Kaizen method, right? I mean, that reminded me of Kaizen, right? Uh, that, that we can do a little bit extra. But I think the only exception that I put that is to our money aspect. <laughs> uh, that, you know, we can, uh, we can do with our, our limit. And, uh, and then everyone becomes happy in that regard. Yeah, I remember my first class of finance in uh, in my MBA. Uh, the professor was teaching us about economic value added. Um, and so I went to him at the end of the class. and I'm like, I get that. But do we have an equation for societal value added? And and he told me, he's like, it's interesting that you ask that every year he gets somebody asking him this question. And he's like, a lot of times it's like people, for example, in the military or in ministerial kind of government. Um, organization because there you're not it's a great example of organizations that are not trying to maximize economic value but to create safety or education or access to food or whatever it is which isn't quantified in dollars right um, and I think that you become truly fulfilled when you're able to contribute in that way I truly align with you on that I'm going to take another question too from the audience uh, and then I have a couple more questions for you myself um, you know we did talk about the ways in which we can do it as leaders uh, and as role models sometimes to inspire uh, that mindfulness and self-compassion. How do we, how do you kind of operate with that on one hand and on the other, especially as a leader in, in my case, for example, as a CEO, that's a question that also Rajat put out there, is like we do also encourage our organizations to have a bias for action, right? Like, oh, we need to move, we need to deliver, we need to create value because that's how you also create successful organizations, how do you, what trigger can you place in your own mind to stop yourself sometimes from doing that? How, how would you approach that? And again, that's a, that's a great question. And, and I think that's a question that comes across many leaders uh, when you're leading an organization, because uh, we've seen examples that you have to be uh, really hard uh, when when you're making decisions and don't bring your emotions. And that's the way I grew up as well, listening to stories, 
um, um, reading cases, uh, reading books or movies, uh, and emotions have never been a part of it. And uh, but one of the great examples that come to my mind is uh, is this uh, writer Joan Halifax, uh, who in her book uh, has given that compassionate. Uh, she doesn't mention the leaders, but being compassionate, it means that you have to have a soft front and a hard back. So what these practices do is that that you're able to handle things in a way that you're kind. Uh, let's say you have to make a difficult decision of letting someone go. You can do it kindly. You can work in a way that they understand. Because at the end of the day, you are running a business. Or let's say you have a difficult customer and you decide that I do not want to work with them because they are being difficult at this point of time, where you can just tell them that, you know, we just, it's not possible for us to work with you at this point of time. And the idea of hardback comes in that you are steadfast in your belief system. That for me to grow, I have to make difficult decisions. And I will live by those decisions because you, as you mentioned before, at that point of time, I made the best decision I could. I cannot go back in history. I don't have the time machine right now. Uh, and even if I did, you know, I don't even know if I want to go back or if I want to go to an alternate universe where I can make a different decision. This is who I am. This is the decision I need to make right now. And I make that decision. And the way those decisions are made uh, are by practice, by practicing, by practicing kindness, by practicing compassion, um, and have goals. Um, and, and, you know, I don't have to explain, you know, how to make good goals and all that. I mean, you are expert and I think everyone's expert out there, but what I can add is by practicing the idea of being mindful by practicing self-compassion, and it's a muscle in the mind. That's what it is. It's something that you have to do like brushing your teeth. The mind forgets sometimes. Uh, if you don't brush for a day or two, how do you feel, right? Uh, if you don't exercise, I mean, some people don't exercise, but you know, if you don't brush, everyone does, but exercise, some people may or may not do. But you know, like the way you care about your physical body, you have this mind that needs to exercise. And and there have been a lot of experiments in the last 20, 30 years where, uh, where it has come about that by practicing, let's say, compassion cultivation or by practicing mindfulness or the base of both, which is meditation, where different kinds of meditation, certain parts of your brain grow, which help you make better decisions so that you can respond better rather than directly reacting to an idea. Uh, so I think... That's the way I, th I think you can you can do that uh, and be kind to yourself because we will make uh, decisions which might be difficult, but over a period of time, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. That's brilliant. Thank you so much for asking, answering that question. I, it truly resonates with me. Um, I have one more question before, um, well, two more, and then we'll, we'll wrap up the session also uh, with your meditation as you had suggested. Um, a very practical question. We are now in the era of remote work and we're all sitting in front of our screens for God knows how many hours a day. Um, I mean, it could be like a quick kind of um, conclusion that this makes it harder to be mindful, but I wondered whether you had thoughts about that. I don't know that it's one way or the other, in fact. Um, maybe spending more time with ourselves is not such a bad thing. I wondered if you could share your thoughts around whether this uh, remote work experiment is pushing us one way or the other? I think that's, again, a great question. Uh, what I have seen and what I've experienced by some people that I know who, uh, who have been working remotely, um, that they feel that they need to work more. They need to work more because they are not in the physical proximity and we have conditioned our mind to sit in office spaces for 8, 10, 12 hours, however many long. No one says that six hours, right? Because we are used to this 40-hour work thing. Uh, but maybe we can, we can start reorienting our teams 
uh, and slowly, I think we're moving when you mentioned agile or some of the others that we're, we're becoming task oriented. Um, and uh, when you do it remotely, um, in a way that you finish your task and and then then you move on. Uh, I think what I what I'm seeing is that new leadership models are evolving, new ways of understanding uh, and communicating with people are coming about. Uh, what that means is that leadership is is not just sitting in a corner and making a decision and hoping that everything will work. <clears throat> But it's going to be more challenging that you have to lead by example, more and more lead by example. So I think that that's one thing uh, that's coming out. And as a leader, I think you have to be more of a friend as, as you go forward. Uh, but you'll be wearing multiple hats at the same time. So that, that's one thing that, that I am realizing. The second idea is that, that we have to be extremely clear in our communication. Um, uh, because we're sitting in front of computers. Most of us are working remotely and we have to take care of our health, you know, sitting for more than three, four hours. Uh, and some people sit for much longer, uh, you know, in long term, we, we think very short term because we're very result oriented, goal oriented. And, and then, uh, then things go about differently. But let me put it in perspective why I say that, because uh, we learn most things that we do from nature. We have learned most things that we design, like, for example, a car, the way we have designed a car, it works like a physical human body, right? You know, it has the central engine, which is like the heart and some of the other things. Now, think about it as you're aging, as you're progressing in your age, what do you eat when you're a toddler, when you're a teen, when you're in your 20s, right? You're going far across, like, you know, when you reach the 60s and the 70s or even later, 80s, 90s, if you want to live a quality life, right, what is that you need to do? You need to balance your life. If you, if you spend, let's say, your teen years, your 20s and 30s, your youth, doing things which are not preparing you for a later time, uh, it's going to be challenging. It's going to be challenging. And most people from within, they know that... Uh, you know, why something has gone wrong, right? Why something? We have to be our own therapist in that regard. So I think that's where one of the things that, that come about in, in remote work has to come about that don't think short term, think long term. And given that people are different, I mean, they were already from different parts of the world, remote working was happening, but this is going to be the norm, at least for the next few years. Uh, so that's something that needs to be kept in mind, the whole idea. For sure. And so that brings me to my last question of the day, uh, which is a question we ask all of our guests. Uh, I'm going to ask you to complete a sentence, and then I want you to explain the words that you choose. Uh, so the sentence is, the future of work is dot, dot, dot. So maybe choose a word and then explain it. You know, that dot, 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 given that uh, you've done your MBA, I've done my MBA and some of the others, you know, one of the words that we learn in MBA is depends. <laughs> So the future of work depends on depends on us. You know, it's like the climate. What is the future that we want for our Mother Earth? What is the future that you want for the work environment to be? Uh, if you look at the history of work, it's not that old. It's only three, four hundred years old. These are organizations and, and companies that have come about. How many of them have been in existence for more than 100 years? Very few. More than 200, even less. Uh, I haven't heard anything more than 250 years. Uh, I've heard some around 200. There's a few Japanese organizations that are like 400 years old, but okay. they're really quite the anomaly. Uh, so it's, it's, it depends upon you what you want your work to be, what you want your organization to be. If you're a founder, if you're a CEO, uh, if if you're looking at longevity and not short-term goals, then you make decisions accordingly. Uh, but if you are one of those who are like, let me make some quick bucks and I don't really care, uh, you know, it's fine. But life is all about second chances. Life gives all these second chances. And if you recognize it, you might be able to make the changes that you want. And life will give you a third chance as well. But it's up to you for you to recognize it. I love that. You made me laugh so hard with that. It depends answer. I'm pretty sure 
uh, anyone who's done an, an MBA or attended some of these courses will know exactly, you know, what you were talking about. Um, I think, I, Nitesh, this brings us to the end of um, our chat, and you wanted to also close today's session with a, with a short meditation. So again, over to you. Right. Thank you. I'll just take a couple of minutes. Is that okay, Marilyn? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we'll just do a simple breath meditation, nothing more like the way we started. And maybe we'll just dedicate the practice, the positive energies that have come from here. All right. Brilliant. So maybe all of us who are listening, Marilyn, uh, you can close your eyes. Uh, and if that's uncomfortable, you can just lower your gaze or keep your eyes open. Whatever is comfortable for you. Let's slowly start to inhale from our nose and exhale from our nose. Inhale and exhale. Inhale one more time. And exhale. As the breath settles down into its own natural rhythm, Let the mind relax, focusing only on your breathing. Maybe watching your inhales and your exhales. And as you watch your breath, Undoubtedly, some thoughts may arise because that's what the mind does. That's what the purpose of the mind is. And let those thoughts come and let those thoughts go because you have a goal, you have a purpose of just focusing on your breath. Like an observer, maybe noticing the water pass by in a river, you can notice your thoughts. And some thoughts may want some more attention, but your job is just to breathe and just to observe. Relaxing your shoulders, relaxing your forehead, relaxing your palms, relaxing your feet. And maybe taking a minute to dedicate the positive energy the good vibes that have been generated from our conversation. To the people around us, maybe the ones listening in, maybe the ones beyond who have helped us to be here, the ones who made the technology possible, the ones who make our life daily possible. Maybe we know some of them, some of we don't. And then maybe sending these positive vibes to all the countless others who have been impacted by the pandemic, whether it's their family members, whether it's themselves, whoever it may be sending them healing energy, wishing them well. And maybe silently repeating the following phrases. May you all be happy. May you all be free of suffering. May you all have peace and joy.
and opening your eyes whenever you feel ready. Well, thank you so much for letting me lead this meditation, Marilyn. Thank you, Nitesh. On my behalf, and I'm sure on behalf of anyone who's listening to this right now or who'll be listening to it you know, further in the day, um, I'm really grateful for that space that you created for us. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, and, and thank you for your questions and, and all the best wishes for everything that you and your team does and, and creating uh, all the goodwill that you're creating by doing the work that you're doing. Thank you. That's very kind of you. I will wrap up the session as we always do so that Tala doesn't get upset at me later. Um, as always, thank you, Nitesh, for being such an amazing guest. Uh, and thank you to all of you who attended and asked us questions and engaged and, you know, filled our space with your presence. We're very grateful for that. Uh, of course, we'll be reposting the video um, on our pages, on YouTube, on our website. We're also preparing um, a podcast release in a few weeks uh, if you'd rather just listen to us. Um, and if you don't do so already, please do follow us uh, on our various channels or visit our website and subscribe to our newsletter. Um, I look forward to seeing all of you for our next episode, next Thursday, January 28, 2.30 p.m. Nitesh, thank you so very much and see you all in a week. Thank you, everyone.